Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another webinar sponsored by your dog's friend. In this web webinar, certified canine fitness instructor Liana Burgoyne will discuss at-home canine fitness. Uh, before we start, though, let me tell you more about Liana. Uh, Liana is a certified professional dog trainer and the owner of Liana Fit Canine Conditioning in Washington, D.C., she offers private lessons, both in person and virtually, plus group classes for manners, behavior modification, and canine fitness in the D.C. area. She teaches classes for puppies and adult dogs at Colby's Dog Care in Northeast Washington, D.C. And just before we came on, I saw ribbons on her wall for rally and competition obedience. Um, please put your questions in chat. We will get to them at the end. Um, yeah, I also should mention that these webinars depend on donations. And if you are so inclined, you can go to our homepage, yourdogsfriend.org. And in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see an icon that you can click on for donations. I know that we will all learn a lot today. This is a topic that I know very little about. So it's all yours, Liana. Thank you so much. I also meant to tell you, Deborah, that I'm also starting to teach some group classes at a pet store in DuPont Circle. It's called Doggy Style. It's on 17th Street. Um, so that's a very new thing. So I haven't gotten a chance to tell you about that. But um, I will talk about it in a minute because I do have a slide about about me. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to talk about at home canine fitness. Um, this is a picture of me and my dog. Her name is Puff. And my shirt, if you can read it, it says puppies and fitness, because that is basically the brand, you know, so if you're wondering who I am and who my business is, that's certainly a focal point. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, hopefully I can get rid of that. Okay. Um, so this is my business here, the pink logo that you might see. Um, I'm the owner of Liana Fit Canine Conditioning. I'm a certified professional dog trainer and also a canine fitness coach. That is a certification from Kira Sundance and a canine fitness trainer, which is a certification from the University of Tennessee. Um, so again, dog trainer, I can do kind of basic obedience and, you know, manners and all the stuff that most people are looking for. But I do also focus on fitness for your dog. I am recently become a personal trainer for humans as well. So there's a lot of dogs and exercise in life. Um, I am the head trainer at Colby's Dog Care and Spa. Um, I'm also a paw ambassador with Chippin. So that's a locally owned, women owned company that is sustainably sourcing novel proteins for dog treats. So they make like crickets and um, a bunch of other pretty crazy stuff. Um, sorry, treats out of crickets is what I'm saying there. Um, here we go. Actually, going back a slide, I wanted to mention doggy style again, right? So that's another place where I'm going to be doing group classes, but I won't spend a ton of time on that. This is my dog. Again, her name is Puff. And that's, yeah, some ribbon winning stuff right there. Love that picture. <laughs> I couldn't even pose for the camera because I was excited. So, of course, it's a little blurry. Um, 
but she's a border collie and these are my cats um i only have one cat now but they both hold such a special place in my heart i actually trained um a cat before i trained a dog um because that was the first pet that i had and i can train cats um actually you can train your cats to do all of the things that i am gonna review for your dog today when we're talking about at home fitness so the question i get a lot is like why why canine fitness well why human fitness it's the same thing you know it has a lot of benefits um the question i get a lot is isn't walking enough and that's a great question i would say that walking has a ton of benefits um it is a great start if especially compared to uh you not doing anything with your dog that's for sure um and we do tend to get into that kind of lifestyle where you know maybe they just go out to potty and then come right back in just like we have gotten accustomed to sitting at our desks um so yeah it's okay good it's good walking is good um there's other things though that are gonna make uh, like an entire picture um the other thing about walking is that some people don't really get to do it let's say there are physical limitations to you know the owner of the dog um, and so therefore the dog is not getting a lot of walks um, some reactive dogs have a terrible time being outside because it's trigger central for them um, so at home canine fitness can be really helpful for when you're trying to figure out how to get your dog some activity while not sending them over threshold because of the triggers that surround your apartment building for example um, or even if it's just a rainy day and you don't really have a lot of other options other than staying inside um, so that's why at home canine fitness is important but canine fitness as a whole is again important because walking is only one element one piece of the puzzle so talking about what healthy dogs look like and why canine fitness might be important to create healthy dogs and maintain them so healthy dogs do enjoy slower onset of physical and cognitive deterioration associated with aging they also display more youthful characteristics like you know lower body weight lower fat stores greater muscle strength improved organ function less stress improved mental health and as a result fewer behavioral challenges i'm sure you guys have witnessed that you know that when your dog has expended some energy they're a lot less problematic for you um but you know these are all similar benefits that humans experience when they're experiencing uh exercise so if you've ever done any exercise at all just remember how it made you feel and let's try to apply that to our dogs and unfortunately according to a survey it was the 2016 national pet day excuse me yeah national pet day obesity awareness survey survey excuse me um this is in 2016 it says 53.9 percent of u.s dogs are estimated to be overweight or obese i can only imagine it's probably gotten worse um but what that means is that over 41.9 million dogs do very little exercise um so as a result we do see accelerated aging chronic diseases increased behavior challenges and injuries i'm going to talk about injuries a lot probably um one thing i am not is a vet so i'm not going to be giving any medical advice um i'm also not like a rehabilitation expert in the realm of you know injury type rehab you know certainly i work with these people like i work with vets i work with rehab specialists so that you know those are oftentimes the customers that do come to me um, because you know they need the strength and you know fitness for their dog to kind of recover um but the reason i am going to be talking about injuries is mostly for injury prevention i'm not going to get into specifics about like various types of injuries 
But one of the biggest benefits in my personal and professional opinion is that fitness can really help prevent not only diseases, but injuries. And if you think about even just humans, especially in our elderly population, you know, as soon as people start getting injured, things are not easy to recover, you know? And so we want to get ahead of those injuries and prevent them. Um, But unfortunately, there are a lot of um, poor movement patterns amongst not just humans, but our dogs. And what that means is that that is that our bodies are not balanced, they're not efficient, um, muscles are not engaged or easily activated. So that's what we'd like to do with canine fitness so that we can prevent some injuries and keep our dogs alive longer and better. So this is the whole picture. Going back to like, why is walking not enough? This is the whole picture. We call it the canine total health puzzle. And we call it a puzzle because if one piece of the puzzle is missing, You really don't have much, you know, it's not a complete um, system. It's not, it's not a solid foundation and that dog's health can be compromised as a result. So the pieces of the puzzle, as you can see, are mental balance, strength, cardio, and flexibility. So we're going to talk about each one of these individually. So mental, I know a lot of people are like, what is the benefit mentally of this physical fitness that you're talking about, Liana? And to them, I say that everything is central nervous system. So even yourself, again, I'm always going to compare to humans too, because I think it'll help some of the people understand. But when you do something physical, it all starts in your central nervous system. That's your brain and your spinal cord. You're thinking about what you're going to do. If you're trying to have perfect form in your squat or or when you're running, walking, maybe you're not doing any of those things. Maybe you're sitting. Okay. That's kind of a squat motion. Okay. But you're thinking about what happens. And eventually, even when you're not thinking about it, you're still, it's still happening in the nervous system. Your brain is initiating neurons to fire to get you to do those physical movements. So everything is central nervous system. Um, and that's why mental is kind of at the top. Um, but to get more specific, um, for dogs, it can curb boredom and anxiety. It can prevent destructive behaviors and instill calmness and focus. If we're learning new skills, we're also stimulating cognitive function, which can very frequently tire a dog more than a physical um, type of tiring out. So getting them mentally working is going to be very helpful and luckily does go hand in hand with the physical part of fitness. Um, And as a result, you can see improved social behavior from our dogs when, you know, we're engaging their mind with canine fitness. Balance is another piece of the canine fitness puzzle. This is about maintaining center of gravity. Um, Stabilization is important for there are many muscles in the dog's body, obviously, but there are some that are intentionally there for stabilizing And once your dog is really actively stabilizing themselves, um, their body starts to move more efficiently and, again, prevents injury. Um, And that's something we we definitely want. I think about if you ever take your dog on like a trail um, or a hike, there's an uneven terrain. So these dogs will need to know how to how to recover if they are not expecting certain terrain differences um, as they are running around if they're off leash, for example. But the next one here is proprioception. This is basically limb awareness in space. Um, So same thing, a hike or uneven terrain, excuse me, I was going to say trail, (laughs) uneven terrain on a trail. Um, this is super important because we need the dogs to know where they're placing their feet in space or else, right, they could trip. Just like us, we could twist an ankle. These kind of things are very common when we don't have good balance. Um, proprioception is often referred to as coordination. Um, and that might also be called body awareness, but 
proprioception is specifically limb awareness in space. Um, and that is going to improve over time when you start working out um, for balance. And balance will oftentimes involve the core. The core is the muscles, uh, excuse me, the core is the muscles of the abdominal, um, of the abdominal muscles, the spinal muscles, and the trunk. That's where your core is um, for the doggies too. Now for strength, this one is really important. So it says less fatigue here, and probably that's most relevant for some of our like working dogs or sports competition dogs, um, because you do want them to be able to work for a long time instead of fatiguing. But even for our pet dogs at home, uh, again, the hiking, you know, even if it's just a walk, whatever it is, um, if you want your dog to be able to keep up, he's got to be strong enough to do it. Um, so depending on your level of um, physical activity, which really should be maybe just as good as your dog's, you just want to be able to keep up um, and you want your dog to keep up. So fatiguing less is uh, a result of strengthening your muscles. More power is another benefit of strength. Strength also aids the body in alignment, um, which can super duper prevent injuries. Um, strength can increase metabolism. It is a big factor in mitigating body fat. In fact, it's been known for years in the human fitness community that strength and resistance training is the best way to reduce body fat because when you build muscle, you reduce body fat. In fact, body fat is a symptom of poor muscularity. Um, so it's, it's going to help the dog, not just body composition, but metabolism. Um, it, it mitigates and kind of regulates um, the systems in the body in a way that helps with maintaining their body fat percentage and uh, again, we're looking for strong muscles, right? Um, the other thing about strong muscles is that it, it is influential in supporting the joints. So anytime you're looking to strengthen a joint, let's say you have a bad knee, what you have to do is strengthen the muscles around it. You can't really strengthen a joint, right? It's just like a way that two bones move together, <laughs> to put it simply. And of course, it's not always exactly the way I describe, but the point is that you can't strengthen a joint, but if you're looking for better structural integrity of the joint, then you do need to strengthen the muscles that surround it. And so that is a huge takeaway because um, our dogs are not set up for success biomechanically. I mean, some of our dogs have been bred to really fail, like the way we have bred their bodies to be shaped. So we really need to work on some of these things that can prevent injuries as they get older, or even if they're very young and just wild, you know, jumping off of stuff and, you know, everyone is at risk for injury. So having strong muscles is one extremely valuable way to prevent that. Cardio respiratory fitness. Everyone knows about this one probably to some extent. You know, it's a heart healthy thing to do. Um, it promotes optimum general health. There's weight management involved. Um, it can help with performance recovery. Um, so that one might be more relevant to people who have goals in fitness, which might be, you know, specific to the um, sports and working dogs. But, you know, even for our pet dogs, we still want them to maintain a, a healthy weight. We do want them to be able to recover and maybe handle what it is we expect of them. Um, I'll say that with cardio and to define it better, it's the ability to utilize energy to deliver an adequate supply of oxygen to exercising muscles. Um, so again, if we're expecting these muscles to have any amount of output, we need to be able to feed them oxygen and that's where cardio comes in. Um, so I want to touch on how this is probably the only one that us humans are doing with our dogs, I think, as far as the general population. Um, I know that some of us are bringing our dogs to the dog park or 
again, a trail, whatever it is, they're getting a lot of running around done. And that's really good. Um, some of that can increase likelihood for injury if we don't have strong enough muscles to support the running around that we're doing. Also, if movement patterns are not balanced, you know, with good form, then again, the chance of injury goes up. Um, my point is that if we think we're doing our dogs a favor by letting them run around, we might be, but if that's the only thing that we're doing for their exercise and for their fitness, then we may actually be doing a little bit more harm than good because if the risk goes up, because we didn't focus on the other aspects of the puzzle, you know, the five elements I was just talking about um, for the total canine health puzzle. I think you see where I'm going with this. Um, the other thing is that if your dog is overweight, if, if they're just running around, if that's the only type of exercise that they're getting, that dog is, is definitely at risk for injury. I mean, how many times have you tried to run as a probably not overweight individual? I'm, I guess I'm talking about myself because um, I remember before I used to lift with like weights in the gym, okay, I might run and then I would complain about my knee and I wasn't overweight, you know, um, but I know that if I was, it would be even worse, right? So imagine that that I'm a relatively in shape individual individual going on a run and then my knee would always bother me. And it wasn't like excruciating pain, but it was enough to know something was going on with it, right? Um, so for years, I was off and on not knowing what to do about it. Um, until I started being consistent with my lifting in the gym, which basically, again, made stronger muscles in my legs. Only then have I been able to successfully run without any pain. So if your dog is overweight, it's going to be way worse. Um, and again, it's just high impact, repetitive type of movement. Um, so if you have a lot of weight that's really coming down on those joints, then it is a risk. Um, in fact, while we're on the subject of canine fitness, as we will be for the whole <laughs> webinar, um, I'm talking about, you know, the high impact repetitive type of movement. That is the kind of thing you don't want to do if your dog is under the age of 18 months because their growth plates are not closed yet. Um, meaning that their bones are still growing. And if you put a lot of impact on the ends of those bones, then it can stunt that growth and lead to compensatory injuries. So if your dog is young, we're not doing a ton of like high impact cardio. What I mean is if you're a runner, don't drag your dog with you. Even if your dog is over 18 months old and he's not conditioned to keep up with you, you know, consider these things. Um, you could be doing a lot of damage. Um, I'll also mention that, you know, if your dog is overweight, let's say that your dog has arthritis and he's overweight. Um, if he loses 10% of his body weight, that is the, that will give him the same relief to his joints as certain pain medications. So it's something to consider. I know I've spent a lot of time on this slide, but something to think about um, and, and just be cognizant of. Flexibility. What do you know? Reduce risk of injury. <laughs> that is right. Improve performance for those who have goals. Um, but flexibility is about like proper range of motion within the joint and full elongation of the muscles. So again, this will really help when you are trying to prevent injuries. Now, going back to what I was saying about 18 months old or younger, 18 months old, or older. These are the five fitness life stages. So for puppies, and we're going to say that's under 18 months old, we want to keep it short. I mean, really for puppy, puppy, puppies, really young guys, you do want to yeah, keep it short because their attention span is not going to like keep up with you probably. Um, but we also want it to be fun. We want them to stay engaged. And again, their attention span is not going to support something uh, long, so uh, we're probably actually with puppies going to focus mostly on 
confidence building and um, balance. Those are the main things. We're not going to be doing a lot of high impact, um, high intensity type of stuff. With pets, keep it fun. We want them to like it. That's the only way they're going to do it again. Okay. Just like you guys, if you've ever done a workout that you hated, you probably did not go back to it. Right. That's why so many of these classes are so popular. Um, you know, like the workout classes, whether it's the people or the music, there's something about that that we are finding fun. And that's why we can go back to it, um, even though, you know, fitness is hard. So you do want to keep it fun so that your dog stays interested in it. Uh, for performance or working dogs, you want to keep it challenging because you do have goals. Special conditions, we're going to keep it custom. Um, when you come to me for a specific fitness program that I design for you and your dog, like a customized workout um, or a program, if your dog is going to have special conditions, whether that's a pre-existing injury or right severely overweight, um, which would be like an eight or above. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Purina body score um, scale. It's like a nine point scale or rubric where if like most of us should be like most of our dogs should be at number four, five or six, like that's a healthy weight. And I should have included the, the photo here, but if you're like an eight or above, that means that the dog is um, overweight. So that might be a special condition. Definitely. We need vet approval to work with these kind of cases. Um, and again, that's why I do end up working with a lot of vets and rehab technicians um, because we do want the dog's overall health in mind. So, right, special conditions, make sure you're doing what's safe here. For senior dogs, we're just going to keep it moving. So that means just mobility. Definitely balance is important. I always think about, as I mentioned, you know, um, our elderly population as humans, certainly if balance was perfect all the time, then we would have a lot less falls, a lot less injuries, and a better recovery time um, because having less injuries. <laughs> so senior dogs, we want to keep them moving specifically uh, so that their muscles don't atrophy. And that is when our muscles are not used. So they kind of stop working. Um, you notice a lot of immobility with senior dogs and people, and it's because they're not using those muscles. Um, sometimes when you see people kind of hunched over, it's because they haven't used their postural muscles, the ones that keep them up. Um, so again, keep your senior dog moving. Consider the age of your dog when you dive in to at-home fitness. Now here, form. Again, I talked about efficient movement patterns, proper movement patterns. If we can get the form of your dog's fitness, you know, whether it's a squat or whatever the exercise is, which I'll show you a couple to try at home. Um, if we get the form right, then we are able to target muscle groups. And that's what we need for the fitness program to be effective. Uh, we want to be able to target certain muscle groups so we can support the joints and just make stronger, healthier dogs. Um, and the faster, excuse me, the better your form is, then the faster the fitness program will work. So form is key to success. We want that to be kind of like the priority. Signs of fatigue. So once you start doing some exercises, um, you want to look out for, you know, things that show us that our dog is a little bit tired. And I don't just mean, you know, woke up from a nap. I mean that they are having a hard time keeping up with what you are expecting of them. And remember that dogs are not like us. You know, they also, when they're in pain, for example, they are very good at hiding it. Um, so, and certain herding breeds, for example, like my border collie and, you know, there's a lot of dogs out there that are going to just keep working. You know, they're very food motivated. They, they love to work. Um, so you have to be the advocate for your dog and look for these signs so that you can call it quits before it gets to be a dangerous expectation of their physical limitations. 
Um, so one of them is change in form. So what I mean is if you start off with really good form and you're seeing that form degrade over the number of reps or sets of an exercise that you're doing, that's a great indication that, you know, the, the muscles are getting fatigued and your dog is not able to maintain the form that, that she started with, for example. Foot slips, trembling of the body or muscles, um, changes in panting or breathing, they're limping or offloading a weight from a limb to like another side of their body, um, stretching their limbs unevenly, uh, changes in gait. So if they're walking different than they normally would, or if a dog prefers to do a trot, but now they're slowed down, that might be, you know, an indication. Um, what I mean is like, if you have the type of dog that walks X, Y, and Z type of way, but that, now they're not doing that, you just, you want to be observant. You know, you're looking for what is your dog's baseline in general and what is your dog's baseline today? And how far have we moved from that by doing exercise? So just noticing changes. This one here, grabby for treats. Okay. They're just extra snatchy with their mouth. Um, that sometimes can be an indication of stress. Um, if you're at home in a relatively calm environment, um, being kind of grabby for treats is often a sign of fatigue. It's also something that we would call over arousal. Loss of focus, of course, right? Again, all the physical stuff we do is coming from our central nervous system. So if he's having a hard time focusing, he may be fatigued. Um, this one here, sniffing, scratching, and licking, these are avoidant behaviors. Uh, basically, they are not having a good time anymore, and uh, or maybe they're frustrated, or, you know, muscles are definitely uh, having a hard time keeping up. So they're participating in these type of behaviors instead of the ones that you want which leads me to opting out. You know, if your dog is opting out, like walking away from the entire training situation, um, that's another indication of fatigue. And then offering other behaviors. That's a good one because a lot of really smart and work ethic type of dogs will also do this, you know? So if you're doing, if you're working on a... Um, if you're working on a folding down, which you will see in a few minutes, a folding down and you're trying to get it right. And then they just start offering you something else like a rollover or just something that is very clearly not, not the one you are looking for. Yeah. Your dog's getting fatigued. So look out for these things. Cause again, we want them to come back for more. We don't want this to be like a disaster and, and really aversive, Aversive stimuli is anything that your dog finds unpleasant. So we just don't want this to be unpleasant. Okay, so exercises. Let's get into some things that you can do at home. This is super fun. Shaking a paw I like because everybody loves it. So it's a great place to start because um, you're probably already doing it. Now, there's a couple things that make this very fitness oriented rather than just a fun little give me your paw and show off to my friends. Um, this one, what I like to do, first off, you can do it from the sitting position. If dog wants to sit, you might start there if they don't have a solid fitness foundation. Um, but you can also do it from the standing position. Um, so when the dog lifts its front paw, if you can hold it and, and maybe hold it for five seconds, that's going to be one rep right there. Um, and so if they're sitting, the dog, and they lift their paw, there's a lot of shoulder extension here. So it's a little bit of a stretch. We like that. Um, and of course, we do want you to warm up before you do significant exercise. We also want you to cool down and do a stretch. Um, so certainly this might be something to consider when you're doing your stretch part of the workout. Um, if you're going to, you know, have it very structured like that. Um, but there's the extension of the shoulder. So there's a little bit of engagement there. If your dog is standing and we do a shake a paw, that's going to be a ton of core. And we love that. We want that because the core makes the back strong. If the core is strong, 
the back is less susceptible to injury. And that's because your back is a bone, right? We were just talking about how strengthening muscles decreases the likelihood of injury to joints. So if you want to protect your spine, we need to not only get the muscles around the back, um, but the muscles in the front of the back, which is your abdominals. Um, so same thing with our doggies. We're going to strengthen the back, the core, excuse me, the back, the abdominal, the spinal muscles, all of that is considered the core. So if your dog is doing a shake a paw from the standing position, he's going to be kind of balancing on those three remaining paws while you hold on to that one. Okay, so that's a good one. Recall is also a good one because this is the come when called cue. And I'm going to have some videos for the other ones. But for these two, I feel like everyone knows what they look like. So um, with recall, again, come when called. Now, you can do this in a big grassy area if you have it. But if we're talking about at-home fitness, most of us have like maybe a small backyard. Or if you're in the city like me, um, you might have like a very tiny studio apartment. So um, what you can do if you don't have a long line, a long line is a long leash. It's like 30 feet. You can take that somewhere. That way, you know, it is safe. Um, if not, if you're inside, it's a rainy day, you know, you can just call your dog from wherever they are. Um, if you have another person in the room uh, or in the house, you could have, you know, that person in one room and you in the other. And now you're calling your dog back and forth. And that dog is definitely getting a little bit of cardio with that recall. Um, and it's also a little bit of hide and seek if you can play around with visibility, like one of those people, uh, one of the people are not visible is what I'm getting at. Um, if you don't have another person with you, you can just throw a treat really far and then ask your dog to come back. So there's a lot of ways that you can make recall a fitness exercise. Um, again, cardio is probably going to be the big thing there. Um, so with this one around an object, a lot of us use cones for this, but right when you're at home um, and maybe you don't have a bunch of equipment like me, um, you can use anything. You could use like I don't know if you can still see me, the water cup or um, a shoe on the ground, a pillow, like whatever. It's just an object that kind of provides an environmental cue of, of how to go around it. And if you've never taught your dog to go around an object, there is a couple of ways to do it. There's one really easy way, and that could just be throwing a tree past the object and then calling your dog back. Um, so it's like a recall, except it's around an object. Um, but there's another way to, to do it. And I'll show you with this video. It's from Karen Pryor. Um, if you don't have a lot of training experience, uh, you it, like if you don't know what a clicker is, you're about to find out. Um, let's see. Here we go. I feel like I've been talking a little fast. So, sorry if uh, if you need to catch up. I know you guys have questions. So at the end, we'll definitely get to those. But um, you're going to hear in a moment this woman, she is clicking for the dog's behavior. What that means is that she has a clicker and some of us will just use the word yes instead. A clicker or the word yes is what we call a marker. Um, so a marker marks the desired behavior at the time it occurs and then bridges the gap of time to the real reward, which is often a treat. So if she is going to be marking for what she wants from this dog, she's going to mark for, you know, when the dog starts to go around the object. Um, and because this is a new behavior for the dog that the dog will not likely offer on its own, she's going to use the approach that we call shaping. Shaping is when you reward more, excuse me, it's when you mark and reward for more successful approximations to the end goal. So if the end goal is to go around the object, we're going to first click or yes for when the dog puts its head around the cone or near the cone in the direction that we are envisioning. And then maybe we start marking for, you know, head and shoulder go beyond the cone. So you'll see what I mean in a moment. I'm going to try to quiet down. You'll hear the clicking. Like I said, she's using shaping. Okay. 
So she's clicking for movement toward the object right now. Just like doing anything that looks like what we want. Now she's clicking for one step towards the object. You can see the dog is deliberately acting in this round. He's like, well, this has worked for me before. So maybe I just keep offering this behavior. Okay. And then she adds the physical cue, which in her case is, uh, in her case, the physical cue is like pointing, right? Pointing around the, uh, the cone, which you can definitely do. Um, so again, she is marking for when the dog does something similar to what she wants. Um, again, if you don't want to do all that, you can just throw the treat, call your dog back. This is another great way to do a little bit of cardio, but also flexibility because they're having to do kind of a tight bend along the spine in order to get around that object. Um, so I do like that one. Uh, this is a video of front paw targeting. And actually the rest of my videos are going to be from this company here. It's called Canine Adventure Training. And this is my friend's company. She also has a certification in canine fitness from the University of Tennessee. And she has much better video footage than me. So I've used a lot of her videos because um, I, especially for these particular behaviors or exercises that I think would be great for at home type of fitness. She's got some good stuff. So um I mean, if you're in the DC area, I do a lot of in-person stuff um, with fitness. And obviously I do virtual private lessons too, but my friend Shannon, whose company this is, she actually has online courses. So if that interests you, um, that would be the way I direct you, you know, um, online courses for fitness are really great. So this is actually her Facebook group, which is free. So feel free to get involved in that. Um, you might see it here, Canine Adventure, Enrichment, and Fitness for Dogs. Um, so that's um, where we're getting these videos. If you want to see more of them, I would go there. But what she's going to do here, paw targeting, before I show you the video. Um, basically, she has a mat that she wants her dog to put her two paws on, just like in this photo here, right? Um so two paws on a target and she's going to use like a mat that we have for training. What can you use at home? It could be a yoga mat. It could be a bath mat. Um, it could be a towel or a t-shirt. So the possibilities are endless when you're talking about at home canine fitness. And Shannon is going to use a marker in this video. I'm probably going to mute it, but she's saying yes. It's very quiet. So that's why I'm going to mute the video because you can't really hear her anyway. Um, but she is very quietly marking with the word yes. And that is going to tell the dog that that she has done the correct behavior. Um, here we go. She does. She throws. Oh, here. Yeah. So she throws a treat away from the mat to reset the dog, which also makes the dog have to reapproach the item. So we're just guessing for getting the two paws on the mat. And your dog will probably offer this very easily because dogs do like to explore novel items. And now to increase the challenge, she's going to make the target smaller and then reward for longer duration. So she's using some fitness equipment, but what you can use here are maybe paper plates or like a cookie sheet, you know, a baking pan. Um, so she's yesing for the dog targeting her paws, yesing for duration of the paws being there. She's throwing a treat to reset the dog. That last rep, she threw a treat to the side, just like she did here, to see if she can come back from the side and do the same exercise. So this exercise is going to be special in proprioception, right? Limb awareness in space. Um, so we're basically getting our dogs to be um, aware of where they're putting their limbs. It's also a really helpful foundational behavior for other fitness activities, um, especially when we're talking about having good form. I expect my dog to be able to place the two paws 
um, very squarely and properly in order for other exercises to have good form. Okay, so front paw targeting. Try that one at home. That one's so fun. You can start to um, experiment with like putting those paws on an elevated surface. Maybe it's a step. Maybe it's like the concrete wall outside of Starbucks. That's what, I hope one of my customers is listening because that's what her dog does. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be anything. Oh, maybe an upside down, an upside down bucket or, you know, plastic bin, like whatever, you know, you can do front paw targeting on that kind of thing. And that can be really fun for the dog and for you. Um, so the folding down, whoopsie, let's go back. Folding down. This is a good one. Oh, gotta press play. Hello. <laughs> All right. So, right. I'm going to pause right here just so you can see this. I love how she's marked. This is what I mean. Shannon's got excellent footage because she's marked proper form. So like back is straight, right? It's not flexed or swayed. It's not like arched, you know, certainly there are going to be some breed specific things when it comes to form. Like, for example, the hawks of her German Shepherd might be not as directly underneath the dog, but that's a breed specific thing. Uh, thing. And uh, again, these red lines are really good indications of where we want everything to be. So the paws, um, or excuse me, the front forelimbs, they are, you know, up and down right underneath the shoulders. Um, the hawk in the back, which is kind of like their ankle-ish, um, that is going to be the, you know, straight up and down position as well. So we've got a really good position with her dog, Demi. And right, what we're getting here is abdominal muscles, shoulder muscles. We're engaging the hamstrings and we're teaching a rear weight shift. So you'll see in a moment, what is a folding down? She puts both of her hands, It's both of her hands are holding a treat. So she kind of leads the dog down, right? See it again. Yeah, definitely watch Demi's control. Very good stuff, you'll see, right? Feet don't move at all. One little foot movement of the paw one time, but otherwise all four paws are, are glued to the ground. We're gonna play that again. They're glued to the ground. She's using both hands to kind of, she's not really luring, she's using like spatial pressure to get the dog to fold into the down. And again, this is getting the core um, and the shoulders and teaching the rear end shifting. Cool. Right, see how all of the paws are just stationary. She's using all of her muscles to get up. That's it because her paws are in place. Isn't that beautiful? So good. So good. Little Demi. Shannon lives in Connecticut. So um, I don't get to see her as much, but I, I love her little doggies. They're always showing off doing the best. So that's why I love to use her videos too. Um, fitness bow. This is specific to fitness because it's just a very controlled and square type of movement. Um, we're definitely getting a stretch in the hamstrings and lumbar spine. Um, it's about putting the elbows down. Yeah, of course, there's the core involved too, shoulder mobility. Gonna mute again, but see how the elbows go down. Everything else is stationary as far as paw movement. And this has a lot to do with handling. Like, notice how I went back. Notice how she places her treat hands and then what she does with them. And it's not just that she knows what she's doing. You guys can do this too. You're just going to have to keep the treats near the nose, right? And just kind of see what the body does. Stop moving when your dog's body is where you want it to be. And then again, watch for signs of fatigue. So in this case, staggered limbs, foot slips, over arousal, poor form, offering other behaviors. We talked about these things. And this is her other dog, Zelda. So right, like there is a little bit of a difference here. And she's just really excited. Right. And you can see how she ended up laying down. So that's another behavior that she wasn't 
asked to do, but you could tell that her, her muscles could not really keep up enough to do that, um, to do that bow for as long as Demi was able to. Okay, we're going to squatties. Squats are super fun. I recommend starting with a stable surface first. Um, and there's a reason that Shannon used this inflatable piece of equipment, um, which again, you don't need. Um, so really quick, um, the squat is gonna be, right, you can see that, I think this is Demi, I think it is. Um, she puts her two paws up on this inflatable piece of equipment. She's going to stand and then she's going to sit back down. That is a squat. Now, I recommend trying this on something stable first. So if that is like a stool or a coffee table or just something you have around the home um, to put the two paws on. Remember, we just did the targeting of the front paws. So if you can get them to do that on a stable surface first, that's going to help set them up for success in this way. But the reason that Shannon used this inflatable piece of equipment is specifically to put a more challenging load into the back end of her dog. Because actually, I think this is Zelda. Yeah, because Zelda has um, the tendency to not really engage the rear end, which is like her back leg muscles. Um, she tends to like do whatever she can to you know, sit down in a way that didn't take a lot of effort. So, so Shannon has added this unstable, unstable piece to really make sure that Zelda is working the back end and getting a good squat. Now, if you don't have this type of equipment and you are ready to do something kind of unstable like this, you can use maybe your couch, you know, a pillow on top of the stool that you were just using. So anything that is just a little bit less stable, again, there's plenty of things around your home that you can use. She's doing some, you know, her dog has some experience. So you are just going to use your treats to kind of get your dog up into certain positions until eventually they just will get it especially if you're marking for the right behavior. So when Zelda stands up, she says yes. When she comes down, she says yes. You know, she's marking. Um, if she had a clicker, she might do it like that. Okay. I think that's it. I think it's just replaying. So we're going to, I think I'm going to exit some of these other ones just in case. I don't know. They're not making any noise, so it's fine. Okay. All right. So those are a couple of exercises. This is the last one, I think. Um, and this one is kind of advanced. So what I might recommend for you guys is to, instead of turning around on a plank, let's just have them turn around on the flat, stable, regular floor. And what that might look like are circles or spins. Okay. This is going to be helpful in um, engaging the core, but also um, for flexibility in the spine and um, proprioception, getting their limbs placed in the correct spots to support them. But here you will see that Shannon has her dog on a plank. Yeah, here we go. Hip and shoulder stabilizers are something I did not mention. So that is another benefit to this. Right. Who has a piece of equipment like this? You know, probably not us. But if you have something long and stable, you can do that. Um, maybe it's even just like a, a long rug with a couple of books underneath it um, to get you that kind of stability, but also grip. Um, maybe it's like a long piece of bookshelf. Um, or like a step on your deck. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do. But again, I would start without this though. Just do the regular kind of turning around tightly on the ground, on the regular floor. And that would be a great place to start. Okay, recap. Basically, we just want you to be safe but we want you to keep your dogs moving, warm up, cool down, 
stretch, prioritize form overall. Okay. If we reinforce poor movement patterns, then your dog's body is going to lean into that. And it's just going to kind of get worse over time. And that does lead to injuries. Um, again, you're not able to properly target muscles when you have improper form. And therefore, you're not really ever getting to strengthen your dog if the form is not right. In fact, you're compromising it. Um, going back to, you know, my form when I was running and my knee, all of that. Um, so uh, we want to start on stable surfaces. That's another piece of the recap. Um, go to unstable surfaces only when your dog is really good at the stable stuff. Notice signs of fatigue. Remember the five pieces of the canine uh, fitness or total health puzzle. Um, I mean, because that's what canine fitness is about, is kind of making well-rounded, healthy dogs so we can improve their quality of life and extend their lifespan so they can be around longer. So that's pretty much the recap. And I want to thank you guys so much for being interested in such a nuanced topic that I could talk about for days. Um, I think that, okay. yeah. Any let's, let's get to some questions. Um, would the squat exercises work for dachshunds with long backs and short legs? That is such a good question. Um, so yeah, it can. You definitely want to be super cognizant of exactly it sounds like you're aware that right there is a biomechanical thing going on with the way we bred that particular breed um so you can probably what i would do is make it significantly easier and what i mean is maybe less of an angle so in the squat video that you saw um there was kind of a steep angle with uh her german shepherd so if maybe you made it like I don't know what that angle was, 45 degrees, maybe let's say like 20 degrees for the dachshund to start off. I mean, with all of the dogs, regardless of the way they're shaped, we're always going to start small and work up. So her dogs have been working for a while. So she's able to ask them to do things like that. Um, but if you're new to fitness, which I might imagine is the case, if you're like just starting at home fitness, right, especially with a dachshund. Yeah, you can do it, but we're going to be very cognizant of signs of fatigue and, you know, how he's moving. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, Harry mentioned that some of this equipment you can get at where to go. Fit pause. Yes, yes. F I T P A W S. That's right. In fact, one of the photos that I had on there was one of my clients on um, an inflatable piece of equipment that was shaped like a bone. That's called a fit bone. I, I meant to touch on that because it's so fun. But yeah, fit pause is who makes that fit bone. And they do make a lot of other equipment. You can actually find other. Um, versions of, of equipment like this in lots of locations, like, you know, probably Amazon and stuff. But um, I even use some human equipment. You know, I'm pretty sure Shannon uses a, tr a regular human treadmill. I've got a dog treadmill. Um, but yeah, you can definitely get this stuff online. Speaking of long backs and short legs, can these body types handle jumps? Is there a limit on height? Good question. I would definitely limit the height. Can they handle jumps? It really depends on the dog, you know? So this is where it gets like murky. Cause again, I'm not a vet. I don't know your dog. Um, you know, has your dog had previous injuries? All of these things have an impact on what your dog is capable of. So I think I mentioned something about knowing your dog's baseline in general, and then knowing your dog's baseline today, when you start your, you know, reps and sets of fitness exercises, um, you want to, right, like be aware of those kind of things. So can your dog handle it based on the way that they're shaped? Yes, but you have to bring the fitness to their level first. And so, yeah, it's going to be a limitation on how high, how far, how many reps, you know, the volume of intensity, all of that stuff is going to have, um, 
is going to play a really big factor. So just be cautious. That's why I mentioned safety. I mean, if you want to work with a professional, that's why I'm here. You know, I basically can write you a specific program. Um, if you're looking for a course, you know, online, Shannon has stuff like that. Um, but the point is that when you work with someone, they're going to make it custom to your dog. So if you're worried about making a judgment call, you know, then, then work with someone who has expertise like us. Can you speak to good exercises for a dog? Um, well, for dogs with rear leg amputations and for dogs with front leg, you know, front leg amputees. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So I would say that a lot of core work would be fantastic because as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the giving the paw cue, um, it does work the core a lot. And a lot of those dogs, you know, they have four limbs. And so when they lift one, now they're only gone three. Um, and that is what works their core so much. So you might, and depending on, you know, these tripod type of like rear leg or front um, amputations, if it's a new thing, then you might need to help them. If they've been getting around on three limbs for a while, then maybe you start working on two limbs, you know, the two adjacent limbs. That'll be really helpful for core if you're trying to, um, you know, just give them some strength and, you know, accommodate their limitations. But frankly, I don't find that tr that dogs in this situation are that limited. Like they find a way to make it work. Um, and so you could definitely work on those particular things. If you wanted to work on something that is like let's say they're a rear leg amputee and they only have one leg in the back, um, their squat, like they could do it, but it's going to be definitely a, a thing that we work up to. Um, and it would just be one leg in that case. So that's why it's really important to support your dog during um, some of the harder exercises. And again, work with a professional if you're not sure, because you know we don't want to, again, we don't want to hurt the dogs. We want to look out for signs of fatigue, but a lot of these dogs can do the same thing that a four-legged dog can do. Okay. Um, Elizabeth wants to know what you suggest to use for treats. She said that she started training her dachshund, a lot of dachshunds in this audience, <laughs> a couple of months ago, and now he's getting way too sausage-shaped. Um, um, but he's not motivated to do anything without treats. And she wrote that he is extremely stubborn, which you might want to address also. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, interesting. Yeah, that is a very funny way to put it. And um, I will say that, yeah, first off, um, if he doesn't want to work except for treats, I mean, that's very normal. Um, dogs are very food motivated. Um, when you say that he's stubborn, um, that is what we usually will call a label and labels kind of summarize a group of behavioral observations. So like, what is stubborn? Does it mean that he is not doing the thing that you want him to do? What is he doing instead? Um, chances are what we call stubborn is really just a little bit of confusion, a little bit of lack of motivation. There's a lot of things that get that go into what stubborn might be. Um, but I think a lot of us are under the impression that stubborn is like a deliberate and obstinate type of behavior from our dogs. You know, like, oh, he just doesn't want to do it. He's stubborn. You know, he would want to do it if we can motivate him the right way or, or clearly explain or send the message of what it is we want for that dog. So um, chances are he's not as stubborn as you think, um, and it might just be a, a matter of motivation or maybe, as we had mentioned, signs of fatigues, maybe he is, um, he's had enough. Maybe his muscles are not strong enough to do the things that we're asking him to do. Um, as far as treats are concerned, because I know you don't want him to get too sausage-y, which is hilarious. I love that. Um, yeah, so I did mention that treat company that I work with. The name of the company is Chippin. I really like them because they're high value and a lot of treats that come in a package don't really come off that valuable to our dogs. I mean, they might work for it in the home, which is good. Um, but if you're having a hard time getting your dog to pay attention to certain things, um, this brand I like. Also, you can get a discount if you use my code and you can find my code on my Instagram. But um, 
as far as calories, that's kind of what I think would be more helpful for you is that uh, because it sounds like he'll work for lots of different tastes, your dog. Um, I would use something that is lower calorie, which in my professional experience tends to be the leaner meats. So like boiled chicken breast, maybe it's shred up, you know, you shred it up. Um, maybe it's sliced turkey, like deli meat. That way you don't even have to do any work. Um, because you know, with deli meat, it's mostly water actually, if you look as far as weight is concerned. So it is a low calorie food. Maybe you could use their own food for the, the treats especially if you're in the home and your dog is super motivated by food, then you might be able to get away with, you know, using the dog's kibble. And then, you know, my dog, she works for her food. You know, the night before I scoop out how much food she's allowed to have in a day because I don't want her to look like a sausage. Right. So I scoop it out. I put it in the treat bag and then I use the treat bag when we're on our walks, when we're doing X, Y, and Z. So sometimes she doesn't eat out of a bowl at all because I'm just working with the food and she is getting enough, but not too much. Um, so does that make sense? I know I said a lot of, of words. <laughs> uh, yeah, makes sense to me. In fact, I had not thought of scooping out the amount the day before and working from that. Um, yeah. uh, someone else wants to know, what are some good warm up and cool down exercises? Good question. Yeah. I didn't touch crazy on that um, because, right, I thought it could be a simple question like this because warm ups and cool downs, they look pretty similar. Obviously, warming up, we're, we're going up in intensity. Um, cool downs, we're going down. So we want to start with a warm up. Um, it's usually five to 10 minutes of walking or trotting. It can be really minimal. Um, so that's actually my recommendation for warm ups. And then for cool down, same thing. We're just coming down with the heart rate instead. So maybe it's five to 10 minutes of walking. Um, and then that's actually where you want to do some of your passive and static stretching is during the cool down while the muscles are still warm from the, um, from the workout. So, um, with at home fitness, you might, not be spending like a, you might not be dedicating your entire time to like a very structured program, but as long as you're getting them active and um, keeping them safe with good form, then you'll see benefits. Um, and chances are, if you just came in from a walk, that might be, you know, the warm up that already happened. So that's my recommendation for warm ups and cool downs. Okay. Um, you showed a, a ladder type. PVC pipe construction, you know, the, and a few people want to know how and when would you use those? I know I was going to mention that too. There was a couple of things that I just kind of didn't mention and I wanted to. Um, so this is what we would call a ladder. And yes, it was like a plasticky. Um, that one I got from Kira Sundance. She calls it her rainbow ladder because usually it is multicolored, but I, of course, had to get a pink one. Um, so what would you use that for? When? That's a great question. Um, I'd say the answer to both of those questions is for proprioception. And again, that's limb awareness in space because ideally we're getting our dogs to just walk through those rungs of the ladder um, in a way where they are able to do it without thinking, but still place their paws in the right spot. Um, again, this is a very influential part of the puzzle in preventing injuries. Um, so that's when I would use it is when I'm working on the coordination aspect. And the point is to walk between the rungs without hitting any of the rungs. Right. Be able to exactly instead of like stepping on it and tripping and all that, we want to be able to just walk right through it. Maybe you're not even maybe the dog is not even looking where they're going. We want it to be a very natural, like subconscious awareness of where their limbs are being placed in space. And does that teach them? I had once heard that. A lot of dogs aren't very aware of where their back paws are and that this is one of the ways to teach it. Definitely rear end awareness is like one of the first things that I work on. I know I've got some customers uh, or clients watching today and and they're 
hearing this right now and being like, absolutely, we did pivots first, you know, because that is a thing that dogs are just really not cognizant of about where they place their back end and their rear feet. Um, the latter can help with that for sure. Um, although they're going forward, yes, their back feet are also having to um, place in ways that avoid, you know, stomping all over the equipment, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there are some comments here that, that you may want to look at, but I don't see any more questions. One person is saying um, her pup has struggled with his hind legs since little Mm -hmm. And he struggled with jumping and going upstairs because of that. I just see another that. reason to work on the strength. For sure. Yeah. If you're noticing like deficits in your dog's ability, you know, physical limitations, then there probably is a, there's a, there's probably room for improvement in the strength area. Um, of course, going back to me not being a vet, you know, I don't want to like diagnose people with or their dogs with, you know, problems that maybe don't exist, you know, but like if, if a dog, for example, doesn't want to sit down, like there might be pain involved, right? Like you just want to kind of rule out medical problems first. Um, but right. I mean, struggled with hind legs. What does that mean? I'd love to hear like a more specific I guess, struggling with jumping and going upstairs, but like, why? What is the problem with the hind legs? Is it that they're not powerful enough? Is he not coordinated with them? Are they not strong enough? Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of questions involved, and that's why all five of those pieces of the puzzle are so relevant. Okay, and it looks like your email is not on this slide. Oh, no, I can give it to you, or should I? You can see when I pull up the chat, Just right? say it out loud. Yeah, I'm going to also type it in here so that they can see me doing it. But Liana fit canine conditioning at gmail.com. Boy, that you know, was fast. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> somebody stuck it in chat before you even finished. No, it was me. Uh, I, think. I miss the word that you said refers to what you teach them to become more aware of their hind end. Could you repeat? I think it was proprioception. Yeah. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. Cause proprioception is not specific to the rear end. It's about just like limb awareness in space. But yeah, when I was talking about the rear end, yeah, definitely proprioception. Um, it was, I think, um, on another slide. You said, no, it was what you teach your clients. Mm -mm. Rear end pivots. So that's that word I'm describing like an exercise. So what I do is I have the dog do the two paws on. So the two paw targeting that we saw in the video. What I do is I'll have them do the two paw targeting on like something, maybe like an upside down bucket or like something round usually. And so maybe they're elevated. And then I'll just use my body pressure to get the dog to move its back feet, um, the ones that are on the ground, around the bucket that they're leaning on. And that's what we call a rear end pivot. Um, and that helps get them aware of the control of their rear end. Um, Oh, and then you just want to mark for when they do that. So if they move their back paw at all, we're going to say yes and give a treat. Or if you have a clicker, we click, give a treat. So we're marking for our desired behavior. And then at some point you wait until the next progression. Right. And mark that. Yep. Um, what is the name of the scale for obesity? Purina body score. Okay. Yeah, it's a nine point. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, that's it. Just that, like, you know, if you're looking for where you are, yeah, I would look it up. It's all over the internet, but basically, you're just going to look to see, you know, how good of a tuck do you have in the waist for your dog? And then, you know, you can decide if they're a number four or five or whatever. And that can help determine what we have to do to make them a little bit healthier. Okay, that looks like we are finished with everyone's questions. So let me thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe somebody will 
get in touch with you for more information. If you do have questions, feel free. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely taking fitness clients. So yeah, definitely reach out if you have questions, but thank you, Deborah, and everyone at Your Dog's Friend and everyone for being here. I enjoyed it. And thanks again. Okay. Bye everyone. All right. Bye.